in my research institute, we usually have the opportunity to get a pre-market release. So a limited market release where we are one of the first. So from the first day on, we were using the lens and uh, especially the Toric version. I think I was the first one in, in Germany using it. And uh, from the first day on, um, we had excellent outcome. Ray-1 EMV and Ray-1 EMV Toric are not diffractive lenses. They are uh, refractive lenses that uses the concept of inducing spherical aberrations to induce a more deeper depth of focus effect. They use 100% of light to do that, using 100% of the incoming light, not splitting it like a trifocal lens to like 30% for the near and 30% for the distance. You have a much better contrast and much crisper image compared to some of the other premium lenses. The fascinating thing is that with a slight amount of monovision, half a diopter, one diopter, you get up to one and a half, two, 2.25 diopters of uh, depth of focus, which is very competitive to classical uh, EDOF or even trifocal lenses. But you don't have an, this on the expense of losing vision quality. And that is the important part here. The normal cornea has some positive spherical operation and a lot of companies try to compensate that with an intraocular lens. With that, you narrow very much uh, the depth of focus. And the EMV has a built-in uh, enhancement of spherical operation. They induce positive spherical operation and with this, they increase the depth of focus. And this is a natural type of increasing the depth of focus because our optical system is used to it. And um, so with this is kind of disruptive technology in terms of creating a non-diffractive technology without rings, without halo glare, stuff like this, and still getting the patient to a point where he can get good intermediate and uh, even reading acuity. Yeah, when you look especially also at the uh, uh, Toric version of it, uh, you have to say that they really take advantage of the long development of the platform. When you look at the uh, EMV lens, you see this kind of closed loop haptics, uh, which I attach to it. And uh, this is a specific haptic design, which prevents decentration and rotation. When the capsular back is shrinking, it kind of stays exactly at the same position. We already saw that when the, in the previous models and could uh, show that also with other the early toric versions, that this is a spot on a very safe and stable uh, situation. And this is what you need if you want to take advantage of the specific optic, which gives you better depth of focus. The other thing is the lens is very smooth. So guiding it around the capsular bag is very easy. Uh, you don't need to fear that you will damage the capsular bag if you have to do some correction. The closed loop haptic has the advantage that after a couple of weeks, lens epithelial cells grow through it and really fix it in the right position. So you won't have any kind of late decentration or late uh, rotation, which this is very, very advantageous. It is an interesting concept to look at the very first lenses that have been implanted in, in several countries, because at that point, normally, you don't have 100% optimized A constant and stuff like this. But the interesting part was that all these uh, um, centers that started with it had excellent outcome. So there was no learning curve. There were no outsiders in terms of uh, outliners, in terms of the values. And uh, of course, you look for the ideal pa patient and have good outcome normally. And everything paid off. Everything really developed like this. And the uh, outcomes were very comparable between the different countries or the different surgeons. For a first release, this is very interesting and it's encouraging for the other doctors that follow that somebody has tried it, come out with good results, a constant is good, reliable, then the next uh, wave of surgeons can use it and can be sure that they won't have any issues. Um, the spherical operation is something that changes over age and that is an individual factor of every patient. And uh, when we look at let's say, data from several hundreds of patients. We do some studies, normative data study with, uh, with the Pentacam. We see the variation and also how it changes over time. So there is some variation in it anyhow. 
which uh, gives you the confidence that the lens is also very forgiving. IOL calculation is, is if you are a little bit off, half a diopter, don't worry, you still get the 2020 outcome. You may lose a little bit of near, but nevertheless, you have the, uh, I call it the, the parachute landing zone where you can uh, land. And this is uh, quite good for the surgeon. The extra forgiveness gives you an increased profile of patients who can adopt the technology tool. So if you have a patient where the measurements were difficult, who has a dry eye patient, who has previous corneal refractive surgery, you like to have an implant that has some kind of forgiveness. This extra half a diopter can make the difference between a happy patient and an unhappy patient. And therefore, all these lenses that enable a certain range of forgiveness are very, very much appreciated. On the one hand, the surgeon can use this in uncertain cases. On the other hand, he can use this uh, range he has for uh, an algorithm or a normal gram to uh, create mini monovision or other things in order to get the full range of vision. So he can use it in both directions. Normally, when we look at the data we get also from the big societies, we have to say that only 60% of the average surgeons get plus minus half a diopter to where they target it. So 40% are off that target. And this has an impact. Now, if you have one diopter uh, uh, miscalculation, you lose half the 50% uh, of, uh, of the visual acuity. So if you are able to move that up to 80 or 90%, then you're much better off. And with this forgiveness, you get to that point. The patients where we struggle, even if we are very experienced surgeon or a very experienced center, are the higher ametropic patients, so the high myopic patient. Just had a patient who got like a plus nine diopter uh, EMV, uh, where I did the monovision. And uh, in these patients, even production of the lens has an ISO standard of plus minus one diopter. So in these patients, sometimes you are really uh, in a critical phase. And if you have a broader landing zone like with the EMV, it doesn't matter. Well, this particular patient I had two weeks ago with this was perfect. He ended up uncorrected uh, 0.8 to 1.0 in distance, intermediate, and even in near. So we were very happy with this like one diopter monovision in this patient. And we really hit this, the target even though we are talking about a high myopic patient. High hyperopic patient, post LASIK patient, uh, uh, other uh, uh, patients that we could consider here. I think the uh, Ray-1 EMV and the whole system behind it is ideal for every cataract surgeon, even especially those who haven't done any refractive procedures yet, who are kind of in the merge of thinking, do I go with the trifocal lens, who are afraid of creating problems, it's a very safe thing to start with the EMV. First, just do a normal ametropia, then monovision, then getting really in the, in the uh, refractive application of this. And, and this would really put them in a, in a completely different profile compared to what they were first. Then the experienced uh, refractive lens exchange surgeon or presbyopia surgeon will take advantage of the fact that you have no side effects, that with mini monovision, you can create a good depth of focus. So it's very competitive to the standard so-called trifocal lenses we have on the market and the emerging EDOF lenses that come more or less every year. So it really is a platform. If you exercise it very much, you can almost use it in any kind of patient. Okay.